Welcome to another episode of The Brand Called You, a podcast and podcast show that brings you leadership lessons, knowledge, experience, and wisdom from thousands of successful individuals from around the world. I'm your host, Ashutosh Garg, and today I'm delighted to welcome a very, very accomplished in professional from the world of technology from Cambridge, UK, Mr. Brian Norton. Brian, welcome to the show. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you. Brian is a crypto and Web3 writer. He's an advocate and a thinker. He's an active member of the crypto community on LinkedIn and publishes a weekly Substack newsletter on crypto and blockchain technology. And he's a passionate photographer. So Brian, before we talk about crypto and Web3, tell me a little bit about your own journey. Sure. Um, I grew up in the um, 1970s and 1980s. Um, my father was um, very involved in technology. Mm -hmm. um, and so I, I grew up surrounded by technology. Mm -hmm. He had some very interesting contraptions in his study, which always fascinated me, which included a, um, a kind of a tele typewriter that was connected via an acoustic coupler to the computer department in Cambridge via a telephone line. So that was like an early um, sort of modem, I guess you could mm -hmm. call it. And he had an Apple IIe and the first Mac. So I, I was kind of, I was destined really to be interested in technology. Oh, right. mm -hmm. um, so that's been a kind of a strand throughout my life. And art has been another strand, music and um, photography. Professionally, um, I started off in contract publishing, which was mm -hmm. kind of business to business and business to government um, reports and um, technical papers and that mm -hmm. kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. And then moved into the Commonwealth, um, where um, I worked for an NGO as a director there for a while, um, uh, looking at programs that promoted trade and investment on a, mm -hmm. an intra-Commonwealth basis. And... Uh, was responsible for helping to put together a, an ICT for development um, initiative that became a communique that was ratified by um, Commonwealth heads of state at one of their biennial um, Chogham meetings. Mm -hmm. And um, I got kind of fed up with the Commonwealth in the end because I felt like it was very good on paper, but, um, you know, part of it felt like the idea was to maintain the status quo rather than do anything particularly Fair exciting. Fair so I moved into the private sector from there and um, uh, uh, basically involved in uh, communications outreach, investment outreach programs mm -hmm. for um, governments in emerging markets. So corporate journalism and strategic communications, leadership communications, ghostwriting, that kind mm -hmm. of stuff. Um, but um, crypto has kind of been in the background for me since... Mm -hmm. 2008 2009 and the financial crisis mm -hmm. um but more recently during the covid lockdowns um well a lot of my traditional uh work dried up because it was contingent on international business meetings mm -hmm. um so i decided to double down really and turn what had been a, a sort of a long-term um interest into a professional pivot into the space fascinating fascinating so let's talk about crypto and Web3. Um, I'm going to ask you a very basic question for our viewers and listeners. Can you explain what is Web3? Yeah, um, I mean, it's an interesting topic. I mean, first of all, I think the the, the most important thing to say is that these um, titles, uh, Web1, Web2, Web3, they're not kind of empirical. They're based on, um, you know, like, models of thinking mm -hmm. or concepts really mm -hmm. um web two uh well i'm sure you've heard the kind of trope that web one was was uh was read only mm -hmm. web two was read and write and web three is read write and own mm -hmm. and i think you know that's a kind of an, an interesting um or succinct starting point but mm -hmm. web two um is widely regarded as um, a sort of an evolution of the original web that was based on a more participatory approach. Mm -hmm. um, so um, it encompasses things like 
um, the blogosphere, mm. social media, user generated content and mm. all of that s- side of thing. But we got involved in a kind of a, a, a Faustian pact, really, without knowing it at, at the time. And um, it's what has since been become known as surveillance capitalism, which mm-hmm. is the business model um, where these services that we use, which are for free, um, are not are not for free. We're actually the lunch. Mm. And um, through the extraction of um, data and the control of choke points, the, the, both the value, we've been commoditized basically, and the value has been extracted by a series of mm. huge companies, the majority of whom are based in Silicon Valley, you know, people like Google and yeah, yeah. Uh, Facebook, et cetera. Right, so, so Web3 is really um, a kind of a paradigm shift away from that by utilizing uh, blockchain technology, cryptocurrencies, and tokenization, and the the primitives surrounding blockchain mm. technology to create a uh, a new kind of internet which is based on um, distributed um, systems, decentralization, and um, it, sovereignty, user sovereignty over data, and the exchange of value over the internet. Mm. Thank you. Great explanation. And uh, we spoke a little bit about crypto and blockchain. Uh, tell me a little bit about how crypto crypto and blockchain can be applied to fields outside of finance. Sure. Um, um, I think, um, I mean, social media is a, is a, is a, a big one. Um, uh, so we're very used to the fact um, that we, um, we have to go through these choke points to interact with people and we don't own our social graph. Um, we can get cancelled, you know, um, or censored. So um, I think that this new kind of um, architecture of blockchain technology and the exchange of value mm-hmm. lends itself to a, a more decentralized form of social media. Mm-hmm. I mean, there are various experiments going on at the moment, but um, you know, there's the problem of network effects, um, uh, you know, uh, uh, networks like mm-hmm. um, Facebook, for example, are so far ahead that, you, you know, you people use them because people use them. So there's a, you know, there are barriers to overcome in its very early days. But I would say social decentralized social media is a, a very important use case mm-hmm. um, outside the world of finance. Mm-hmm. Um I think you know there's um the whole creator economy so if you look at music streaming for example music streaming doesn't work for um uh, musical artists it, you know there's there's no money in it so mm. um web3 and tokenization can be used to forge direct um relationships and links mm-hmm. between musicians and their fan base mm. uh, so i think and you can um, extrapolate that across the whole creator economy really that uh, it's a way of disintermediating the um you know the the uh, middlemen for want of a, a better expression mm. um, from the equation in lots of these mm. kind of areas in terms of user generated content Correct. um Likewise, you've got um, metaverse and gaming um, um, and the ownership of in-world and in-game assets. Mm -hmm. I think that's going to be increasingly uh, an increasingly interesting space over Mm -hmm. the next five years or so. Um, And um, I mean, I think you've got supply chains in Mm -hmm. terms of um, establishing authenticity and certification and, and all of that stuff mm-hmm. um and decentralized autonomous organizations is a very interesting area which is very nascent but um mm-hmm. i think that's going to have profound implications going forward so there are a whole host of um different applications of this technology outside the world of finance absolutely and uh based on all the work that you have been doing what do you see it's are some uh, what do you see are as some of the big hurdles for uh, mainstream adoption of crypto, which is under a lot of fire these days, and blockchain, of course. Sure. Um, I mean, I think the main hurdles are, first of all, um, what they call UI, UX. So Mm -hmm. basically the user interface, the user experience, um, 
Web3 applications at the moment and um, decentralized finance and all of these different areas are notoriously mm -hmm. clunky in terms of their user interface. Mm -hmm. And that is a huge barrier to mainstream adoption. Mm -hmm. Most people understandably wouldn't touch it with a barge pole. And um, I think really what's going to happen is that um, that needs to be fixed and it will be fixed um, in a way that people are describing as at the moment as Web 2.5, where mm -hmm. you take some of the um, the architectures, but you sacrifice some of the decentralization in, in order to get a more seamless experience. And I think ultimately a seamless experience means, you know, ultimately something equivalent to Apple Pay, you know, something or, or having um, a digital um, airline ticket in your wallet on your smartphone. Mm -hmm. um, things that aren't going to spook people um, that aren't going to lead to uh, security blunders and all the rest of it. Mm -hmm. um, and then I think um, these other two points are interconnected. I, I think there are a lot of bad actors in the space, a lot of mm -hmm. scamminess, yep. um, a lot of security breaches, and that needs to be cleaned up. Mm -hmm. And it, it can only be cleaned up ultimately by thoughtful um, regulation um, that balances the need for um, fostering innovation with uh, protecting consumers and and mitigating against any mm -hmm. systemic risks. So right. I think those are the main areas. No, no, well said. Great response. But what do you think are some of the security concerns relating to crypto? Um, security concerns? I think, um, again... Um, UI UX, mm -hmm. the complexity of it is a major security concern. Because um, if you if you take, for example, um, anyone who's purchasing NFTs on Ethereum at the moment or whatever mm -hmm. using a, a a software wallet, a mm -hmm. hot wallet, mm -hmm. um, may not know what they're they're signing. Um, they they may not understand what slippage is about. Mm -hmm. They may not they they may not understand how to bridge an asset from you know from ETH to wrapped ETH if if it's on Polygon and it's just the complexity of the user experience and the user interface is is you know it's just insane really mm. and that leads to a, a major kind of um mm. uh flaw in the systems in terms of um security. Right. Um, right. And um I think you know more generally that that's a, there's a, a sense of technological immaturity. Um, so these things will be sorted out over time, but we're still, we're still, um, we're still very early. Mm. And, um, and then the other one is um, some of the primitives, things like blockchain bridges, um, blockchain oracles, smart contracts. There are in inherent weaknesses that make them honeypots for, um, people uh, who want to exploit the system mm. at the moment. Mm. Um, so those are all areas, you're, I think. No, you're absolutely right, and I agree with you. But you also, you know, you said a few minutes ago about uh, regulatory bodies needing to uh, regulate uh, crypto. What do you think these regulatory bodies need to do? Because I know a lot of countries are now clamping down on crypto, and yet a lot of them are now using blockchain to be able to launch their own digital currencies, what are your perspectives? I mean, it's um, it's a very interesting area. Um, like most people, I've been following what the SEC's approach has been, mm -hmm. and then more recently, you see um, major players like BlackRock um, applying for spot Bitcoin ETFs. Mm -hmm. So there's a kind of a cognitive dissonance really between those two areas. I have been involved in a project in the UK um, researching DeFi um, on behalf of regulators who want mm -hmm. to get a clearer picture from industry about yeah. some of the novel practices and behaviours. And I think, um, you know, um, putting the the USA to one side, because I think that's a bit of a basket case at the moment, and mm -hmm. I, I think a lot of it might be politically motivated, but I think... Um, regulators in other parts of the world understand that um, this is a transformative technology that mm. has an um, you know um, very positive revolutionary um, um, implications mm -hmm. um, 
and that they need to strike a balance between, as I said earlier, you know, fost providing the right kind of environment for fostering innovation, mm. but also uh, protecting against some of the the negative consequences and ensuring that there aren't any systemic risks to um, to traditional uh, financial services system, mm. for example. Mm. So I think it's a kind of a it's a mixture of of being pragmatic, understanding the technology, and also engaging with the industry, who, um, based on my personal opinion, are extremely um, willing to collaborate and cooperate in terms of trying to explain some of the intricacies of mm. uh, blockchain technology in areas like decentralized finance to regulators. Correct. Uh, the other aspect that I wanted to get your thoughts on were the NFTs, the non-fungible tokens. Uh, what do you think will be their potential impact on creative industries? I mean, of course, I think the hype is over where someone put put painting or someone, a, a big Bollywood star would put a small section of his voice and make half a million dollars on it. But uh, I'd love to get hmm. your uh, thoughts on NFTs and their potential impact on creative industries. Yeah, um, I mean, I think NFTs are, are, are much more important than um, than they're given credit mm -hmm. for in the in, in terms of the mainstream media narrative of NFTs and what mm -hmm. what most people would associate with NFTs, which, as you've identified, is probably kind of um, overpriced pixelated um, JPEGs, mm -hmm. um, and not to denigrate them too much, they have a place in the culture Absolutely. and the yeah. and the history, mm -hmm. but. Um, um, I I did a deep dive into NFTs um, after listening to um, a program hosted by Raoul Powell, who's a mm -hmm. macro investor interested in crypto, mm -hmm. and I realised that I I had um, I'd fallen into the trap of kind of writing them off as a kind of a quirky mm -hmm. cypherpunk kind of like slightly geeky. Mm -hmm. Uh, thing with crypto kitties and all the rest of it and i realized it after listening to him that he'd done his homework and that it was more profound than that so i went back and spent six months researching the space and that included all kinds of things like buying nfts mm. hanging out in overcrowded discord spaces uh being exposed to the scams and the astro turfing of um mm. of of um of communities and and all the rest of it and um, I came back to um, a book that was written by a chap called Nicholas Negroponte in the 1990s called Being mm -hmm. Digital. Wow. And one, one of his predictions was that anything that can be shipped as um, bits and bytes as opposed to as atoms mm -hmm. will be shipped as bits and bytes as opposed mm -hmm. to as atoms. And mm -hmm. this was before broadband, so Absolutely. we were still using dial-up modems. Yep. Um, yep. And um, so it was a bit of a uh, it was a bit of a stretch at the time, but he was mm. absolutely right. And I think a very good example of that is um, Blockbuster versus Netflix. Mm. Blockbuster was in the business of shipping um, atoms, and Netflix was in the business of shipping bits. And we mm -hmm. we know how that turned out. Absolutely. So. So I kind of see NFTs in the same kind of light, really. Mm. That we're in the very early stages of of something which is uh, inferring. Um, digital ownership and digital certification and we're we're living increasingly in a digital world mm -hmm. so i think nfts are, are rather profound at least as profound as bitcoin for example mm -hmm. um uh, i don't know how you'd carve them up as an asset pass because i think nfts can be everything from community passes to a means of tokenizing software mm -hmm. as a service to mm -hmm membership passes to um uh, gary vaynerchuk has even suggested that invoices and receipts could mm. be nfts mm. so i think really it's to do with the economy of this in the same way that um people now use um digital photographs as a memoir they might take an image of um their shopping list mm -hmm. on a piece of paper and bring it with them to the supermarket mm -hmm. because because the cost is so close to zero that it's negligible and i think the same will be true of nfts so i think they'll be used in all kinds of profound ways and they'll be mm. ubiqu ubiquitous within say 10 years mm. well said so uh brian i have time for two more questions my next question is that uh i'd love to get your thoughts on what are the ethical implications if any surrounding the use of blockchain and crypto yeah um i mean 
it's clear on it's that, that I split this into sort of two camps really. Mm-hmm. I mean, it's it's clear that we're somehow moving towards a a cashless society. Correct. And um, all of uh, a lot of the governments seem interested in these CBDC pilot programs, and um, there are concerns about the programmability of mm-hmm. money, all of which is entirely justified in my opinion. And um, you know, it's like we're we're moving to a digital, uh, a form of digital singularity where mm-hmm. you know all all value is uh, um, is is not represented in in terms of cash and things that are in the real world. Mm-hmm. And I th- think that kind of represents a, a threat because it's happening so fast that mm-hmm. the majority of people don't, uh, for example, well, perhaps they don't even under really understand cryptocurrency, so they certainly don't understand the the distinctions between. Um, uh, uh, cryptocurrencies operating on public blockchains and mm. um, the kinds of um, systems uh, being proposed by central banks right. and right. governments. So right. I think that that kind of represents a, a significant sort of mm. threat that we need to kind of um, be aware of before it overtakes us. Mm-hmm. Um, and then, I mean, I think... Um, you know, there's the origin story of 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 Bitcoin mm. on on the other side of that, which is that a lot of this is about freedom. It's about distributed systems. It's about removing the choke points, and it's about um, uh, in the same way that if you looked at, at the Reformation, that you've got a separation of um, church and state. Really, what this is about is a separation mm. of of money and state, and I think that's a very important kind of movement in terms of um uh the democratization of, mm. of of value so i think you know that's that's very interesting on the flip side so it's about um you know people talk about banking the unbanked but the the other side of that if you look at defi maximalism maximalism for example is that it's actually about unbanking the banks mm. so um yeah so there's a kind of a polarity there of different yeah. aspects mm. Very interesting. And my last question to you, Brian, and this is for the thousands of people who will listen to our conversation. Based on your deep understanding of this whole space of crypto and Web3 and blockchain, what would you say are three lessons you would want a lot of our young viewers and listeners to take away from our conversation? Sure. Um, I mean, uh... That crypto is about uh, uh, more than money. It's about uh, digital ownership, digital mm. property rights, mm. um, permissionless innovation. Mm. Um, it's about computing and networks, and mm. uh, and um, important issues like decentralization. And mm. um, I guess it's you know it's like adding a new dimension to the existing internet, which is why it's called mm. the Internet of Correct. Value. So so I mean I would see it as being um, you know, changing the internet from a sort of a two-dimensional interface to a to a more th- um, three-dimensional yeah. interface. Mm-hmm. Um, the other, which we've just touched on, I think, is that NFTs are a big deal mm-hmm. um, and um, shouldn't be written off as just a means of um, selling anthropomorphized yeah. uh, cartoon monkey JPEGs. Mm-hmm. Um, and that you know they're um, they're at least as important as Bitcoin over the medium to long. Term, mm. it's like mm. a it's a, a new evolutionary offshoot of Correct. crypto and blockchain technology. Mm. Mm. And then finally, um, if people are just starting to get interested in this space, I would say, you know, we're still very early, and I know mm. that's a bit of a kind of a cliche. But mm. if you're if you've suddenly kind of thought, oh, crypto, but Bitcoin's thirty thousand, and it's it's too late, you know, um, I would say firstly, it's it's not all about sort of financial gain it's about Mm. technology but if you're interested in this space uh don't uh for heaven's sake feel like you're you're too late to the party Mm. there's still Mm. still a lot of room for um for getting involved so i would encourage people to do so Mm. wonderful and on that note brian and your wonderful lessons crypto is more than money it is about digital rights second you said was the non-fungible tokens or the NFTs are a big deal and should not be written off. And the third one, which is very, very interesting, it's not as if 
the entire crypto or the Bitcoin cycle has come to an end. These are still very early days and it's never too late. Thank you so much for speaking to me about your own journey. Thank you for talking to me at such length about crypto, Web3 and blockchain. I learned several new things from you today. Thank you again for speaking to me and good luck. Thank you very much. You too. It's been a pleasure. Thank you for listening to the brand called You Videocast and Podcast, a platform that brings you knowledge, experience and wisdom of hundreds of successful individuals from around the world. Do visit our website www.tbcy.in to watch and listen to the stories of many more individuals. You can also follow us on YouTube, Facebook, Instagram and Twitter. Just search for the brand called You.